right. Hello, everyone. This is Laura from the Greater Hamilton Chamber. I'd like to welcome you today to Crisis Recovery, Wealth and Health with Lisa Sandlin. Um, let's go around real quick and do some introductions. Um, Lisa, we'll leave you to the end since you're going to spend the most time talking to us. Nancy, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. I'm Nancy O'Neill with the Greater Hamilton Chamber. I do our events and our Leadership <coughs> Hamilton program. Judy. <laughs> so, hi, I'm Judy, and I'm in the greatest Hamilton Chamber of Commerce. Tammy? <clears throat> yep. Tammy Walton, I'm the Finance Director at the Chamber of Commerce. Kumar, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. This is my first meeting. My name is Kumar Sundas. I work with Easter Seals uh, together with the Jill. And Judith is our intern. And in fact, Judith is seeing me for the first time. <laughs> oh, that's good. Hi, Judith. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany, you want to introduce yourself real quick? Yeah. Hi, I'm Tiffany Grubb with the Greater Hamilton Chamber. I'm the Director of uh, Membership and Marketing. All right. Lisa, we'll give it all to you now. All right, I'm Lisa Samlin, and I do a lot of different things, so we'll talk about that as I get into my presentation. So I'm gonna share the screen now, so that makes you guys all go away from me, just so you know. Okay, so this is the second of our crisis recovery series, talking about wealth and health. Um, we look at body, mind, spirit, and financial health today. We are going to um, focus more on the financial side, but I wanna do a little review. Um, this is who I am. I've, I've been an entrepreneur. I've had my own business since 1977. Uh, I am a recent stage three colon cancer survivor, which has changed a lot of my life. I have recently become a certified fitness instructor. I am a certified financial educator. Um, not too many of us in the country, but I am one. Uh, I'm also a licensed financial advisor. I have a bachelor's in design, a master's in architecture from UC. I was a professor for 10 years, both at UC and Miami. Um, and I have a lot of life experience because I'm old. Um, it just comes with um, the territory when you've lived for 60 years. So our session one, we covered keys to a stronger immune system. We talked about incorporating um, more plant-based food and better nutrition into your diet. We talked about how important exercise is, especially for those of us working at home and all of these Zoom meetings and all the times that we're sitting. <clears throat> it's real important for you to get up out of your chair and move, go outside, get some sunshine. We talked about the mental aspect that if you think you're going crazy, that you will. Um, we're going to talk a little bit more about that in today's presentation, but it's extremely important to keep a positive mental attitude, and that is up to you. That's your decision, whether you're going to go positive or whether you're going to go negative. We talked about where did all my people go. That's the spirit side. We all need connections with other human beings. It's, it's an important part of our lives. We also need a connection to a higher power. Um, we talked some about keeping the connections through Zoom. I'm loving it now that things are starting to open up a little bit. We can get out and see people and talk to people, but um, we do need to still social distance and be responsible. And then we talked a little bit about money, woes, and wins. I went through the seven milestones to financial security, which these are those. Um, number one milestone is getting a financial education. So that's what we're doing. Um, two is proper protection. Three is establishing an emergency fund, which is critical. And I think people are really realizing through this crisis how important having some funds stashed away for those emergencies. You guys, it's not if they're going to happen, it's when they're going to happen. Um, it's critical to manage our debt. And I'm afraid of what this crisis is doing to people's credit card debt. Um, you have to understand your cash flow through budgeting and knowing what you have coming in and what you have going out. It's important that we build our own wealth. Um, we've made this shift to personal responsibility in our society. We don't have companies that offer financial um, well, pension plans and things like that so much anymore. We've, we've become self-directed in that area, so it's critical to build our own wealth. 
And then it's also critical to protect our wealth and then understanding how we need to pass it on. We talked a little bit about wills and the importance of having a will. Um, for those of you that um, I've given a book to, and I think everybody on the call except maybe Kumar has a book, <clears throat> Just remember that education without execution is mere entertainment. One of the reasons that I became a financial educator through the Heartland Institute for Financial Education was because they asked me to because I was already a financial advisor. So in order for me to educate and help people implement a plan, I have to hold both, um, I have to be um, educated in both areas and licensed to do that. So in session two, we're gonna talk about how important it is to understand how money works. Here's the book. Um, if anybody on this presentation does not have a book, I will give you my information at the end. Please feel free to call me or email me or contact the chamber and they will reach out to me and I will make sure that you get one of these books um, in your hands for free. You can order it on Amazon, but it's $16.99. So as a financial advisor, I would encourage you not to do that if you can get it for free. This is one of the co-authors. He was recently on a morning show, a morning news show, and I wanted to share Steve Siebold's information with you. So I'm going to, takes us a little bit to queue up here, but as soon as it can, we're going to look at his show. I don't want to get into that. <laughs> I want to see this. Were you forced to take a pay cut or worse? Did you lose your job during the COVID crisis? Well, here's the secret. In a world full of chaos comes massive opportunities to make money. All right. Well, that's some good news. And to give us some tips on how to do Let's talk about Grammarly. I don't know why that happened. Sorry. Anytime you type or text, Grammarly provides quality suggestions to help make you got, we have invited a financial expert and author of the best-selling book, How Money Works, Stop Being a Sucker, Steve Siebold. Good to see you, Steve. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for joining us. So, you know, very few people really know how money works. It's so interesting that there are not more courses taught in schools, right? It's unbelievable. We don't, we don't teach anything. We don't teach our kids anything about money. And the things that we do teach them in the schools typically don't really matter uh, in their daily lives. And it's really a problem. So what is the, really the difference between how wealthy people look at money compared to those who are not wealthy? Well, the self-made wealthy, which I've studied for the last six, 36 years, look at money in terms of opportunity and, uh, and freedom and really the chance to, to live a, a more stress-free life, whereas most of us are, are taught to think about money in terms of scarcity and fear, and which there's a lot of, obviously, a lot of fear out there right now. So what are some of the financial steps that we can take during the quarantine? I think a lot of people are hoarding their money probably right now. <laughs> Well, that's true. And I think the first thing I would recommend is change your, your, your perspective, your attitude about money, and start looking at it in terms of possibility, again, and freedom and dreams and all the things that really built America. That's, I think that's the first one. But, but wait, before you ask the second, how do we do that? Well, I think it's a, mind sh it's a, mind, a mindset shift that we have to make. Study, study wealthy people. See how they talk about money. Read their books. Look, read their biographies. Watch their interviews on YouTube or the internet somewhere. And just notice how they think about money compared to the way you think about money. You also say to be entrepreneurial. And obviously, there's a lot of problems out there. So you could probably, I mean, just an example, people are making, they're trying to make fashion out of these, uh, these COVID-19 masks that people have to wear. They're probably making a good yeah. buck out of that. They sure are. A lot of people are stepping up. They're becoming entrepreneurs, formerly employees, now turning from what we call E to E. Uh, employed entrepreneur, maybe because they're, they're forced to or they're very creative. I mean, America is, was built on innovation. We're innovators. That's what we've always done for 200 plus years. And this is a, the, probably the greatest time in any of our lifetimes to, to stake your own claim and become an entrepreneur. What do you mean by everything is negotiable these days? 
Well, in terms of in terms of paying your mortgage, your rent, your your any bill you have, a car payment, anything, this has never been seen before in the history of this country. Really, the history of the world has never shut down like it is now. So call your bank if you're if you're behind. If you've got plenty of money, don't worry about it. But if you're struggling, call your bank. Tell tell them that see if you can get a deferral on your mortgage. I know hundreds of people that have gotten de deferments on their mortgages for 90 days or more, their car payments, um, their, their, their rent if they're, if they're renting. And they'll, these companies will work with you, credit card companies will work with you. They're, they've been very good about it since the crisis. Uh, you also say uh, leverage your network. Yeah, this is the time to reach out to your personal network, your professional network, your, your online network, and talk to people if you're looking for a new opportunity. I know a lot of people, obviously 33 million people have applied for for unemployment, and that's a very sad thing, and a lot of those jobs are probably not coming back, unfortunately. So reach out to people and see what new opportunities that you can drum up. Now's the time to be talking to everyone, especially when you're at home, in, you're at home and you have time. And you say get excited for the turnaround. Oh yeah, this is gonna be the biggest turnaround, most likely from a financial perspective, in American history. So the opportunities that are gonna be created from this are most likely going to be unprecedented. So get excited because this, we will come out of this. America always comes out eventually because we are innovators. We are entrepreneurs at heart and uh, the opportunities will, uh, will be fabulous. You know, of all the interviews we've had in the last six weeks, mm -hmm. I'm actually most encouraged by that one. Yeah, sounds good. Thank right. you so much, Steve. We really appreciate it. We'll definitely check out your book. So that was Steve Siebold, the co-author of the book that I shared with everybody. I know Steve personally, he's a great guy. I know him and his wife, they're incredible people. Um, I, I've known him for several years now, so the, he's a, just a wealth of information. So now we're gonna do something a little more fun. Um, we're going to take a How Money Works Challenge. This will take me a minute to pull up too. Um, but this is a little video that we offer um, a little bit of learning and a little bit of a challenge to see exactly how much you do know about how money works. So I'm so, going to play so the video first. That, what, Laura? If we're going to go to that, make sure um, we see your screen. Can you see it? I see your uh, screen with the URL, but if we're going to go to that link, then you'll have to switch over to your browser. Oh, I do? Okay, that went away. That way we can see what you're seeing. Did you see did you see Steve Siebel? You just heard him? You didn't no. get to see it? No, we couldn't see his video. We could hear. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. I don't know how to get it to do that. You might have to stop sharing and then pull up that on your screen and then start sharing. Okay. And then pull up what you want us to see and then do start sharing. Let's see if this works. Oh. So while Lisa's working on that, Kamar, um, welcome. Um, Jill has uh, told us that uh, you are new at Easter Seals, at least with uh, the part here. So, and Judith is um, who you're, she's reporting to you? Yes, yes, in fact, after I joined the Easter Seals, after two weeks, we everybody moved in the home. So I'm still trying to connect those dots and you know learn more about the program and sort of things. That's good. Oh, all right, Lisa. Now Can I see that. Yes. Yes. Okay. So this is a real cute little video. This is also all of this stuff that I'm sharing with you today is on my financial website, which I will give you the link to at the end. But we're going to watch the video and then I'll get out of the video and we're going to take the literacy challenge. <clears throat> Life is full of surprises. Sometimes can be great, like discovering your family is about to grow. Other times, however, the twists and turns of life can be not so great. Like not knowing much about our troubles. Or not you much about having a baby. Or perhaps the greatest mystery of all, knowing 
about this a little bit. <clears throat> so if this is about percentages and understanding percentages and it has been absolutely remarkable to me all over the many years that I've been doing this, even some of the highest educated people that I know do not understand percentages. Um, if you owed someone $500 plus interest, which would be higher to pay back? $510 or 500 plus 5%. Is that 5% over years, like added on, or is that one time 5%? So you're looking at 5% of 500. Okay. So if, and you're just comparing the two, it's not like a story question. It's just if, is $500 plus 5% 5 of 500 more money, or is 510 more money? 500 plus 5%. Five exactly. Mm -hmm. Because, so here's how I do these equations because I know how to do 10% real easy. So mm -hmm. I'll say, okay, so 10% of $500 is 50 bucks, right? So half of that is 25. So I know that B then is 500 plus $25 and that's 525, which is greater than 510. But a lot of people don't understand that. They just don't know the math. They don't understand what a percentage even is. So what about inflation? If both your income and the prices of groceries, gas, and other products that you buy were to double over the next 20 years, how much would you be able to purchase? More than you can buy now, less than you can buy now, or the same as you can buy now? Uh, the same. Exactly. Yes, because if they're going to double, then inflation is going to equal your income growth, right? Yes. So here's compound interest. If you have $1,000 in a savings account earning 1% annually, what would your balance be after 10 years if you never withdrew any money from your account? Would it be more than $1,100? Exactly $1,100? or less than $1,100? More than. He's on it, man. So if you just earned simple interest and it was not compound interest, it would be you would earn the $100 because you would earn that 1% every year on the 1,000. 
but since it's compounding and typically, and we'll get into this a little more later, typically it's accredited monthly. So each month your account goes up. So each month you're earning more interest. And so you're starting to earn interest on interest. Then we have the impact of loss. So let's suppose that you lose 50% of a $10,000 investment, which we've seen this happen twice now since I've been in this industry. How much return would you need to get back to your 10,000? If you lost 50%, do you need a gain of 50%, a gain of 75, or a gain of 100? 100. Exactly, because if, if I lose 50%, I now only have $5,000. So to get back to where I started from, I have to have 100% growth on that money to get back to even. So when you hear, well, the stock market dropped 20%, but we've gained that 20% back, are people back to even? No, they're not. So that's where people have to understand that when you're investing, the impact of loss is critical. And then the last question is risk diversification. Generally speaking, is it more secure to put all your money into one place or more than one place? More. More, more than one place. More, most of us understand that. That would be like um, having all of your money in one stock. And if that stock fell, of course, you have no diversification or having all of your income. I like to talk about diversification. We talked a little bit about it last time of having multiple streams of income. So if you have all of your income coming from one place and you lose that job, you're in big trouble. If you have a diversified income and multiple streams of income coming in and one of those goes away, you can suffice, you can still make it. So those are some of the things, again, if you go on my website, it'll ask you just some real basic questions down at the end, but you can press see your results. Um, this is a real fun game that we play with people. So I'm gonna get out of all this and see if I can get back to my presentation. There we are. So, <clears throat> okay. You need to share again. <laughs> to share again. This is so complicated. All right, so an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. And that's what Benjamin Franklin, and that's a quote out of our book talking about how important knowledge is, especially about understanding and learning how money works. This thing just froze up on me and it doesn't want to change. There we go. So I know that Dan was very intrigued by the book, How Money Works, Stop Being a Sucker because of the word sucker. And a lot of people are offended by this word. But in reality, not knowing how money works really does suck. It will suck up your time, it will suck up your freedom, and it will suck up your income if you don't know how to make it work for you. Here's that mental game that Steve talked about on his news broadcast that we talked about on the last session. That is what we think about, we bring about. Your reality will largely depend on how you think about money. And if you've always struggled and you, you were brought up in a household, there's just so much psychology involved in this and I'm not gonna get into all of that. But if you think that money is hard to come by, it will be hard to come by. If you shift your mind around and think about how money can work for you and how readily available there is money for us out there to take a part of the pie, um, again, you, what you think about, you will bring about. So financial illiteracy is the number one economic crisis in the world. Some of these stats are just amazing. Um, literacy just means competence or knowledge in a specified area. But financial literacy means understanding how to earn, how to spend, how to save, how to manage, and how to invest your money. So when you look at it from a worldwide perspective, um, there are over 5 billion people in the world that are financially illiterate. And that's not just happening outside of our country, it's also the number one economic crisis in America. 44% of Americans don't have enough cash to even cover a $400 emergency. I find that extremely hard to believe. I also heard this morning on a, a news network that 75% of Americans today have been living paycheck to paycheck. No matter what you make, 
These are some people that make some pretty good money, but they're still living paycheck to paycheck because they just think that paycheck's always gonna be coming in. 43% of student loan borrowers are not making payments. This is um, different from the book. If you read the book, the, the, when the book was published, it was 8,000 and something. It's now up to 9,033. And this slide was created prior to this crisis. So I can't imagine what the average credit card debt is today. 33% um, of American adults have zero retirement savings. And the reason for that is we are now, when I started this in, um, well, I guess it's been about six or seven years ago, we started doing presentations. There were only four states out of the 50 that required high schools to teach at least one class in personal finance. We have gotten that up to 21 states. However, the courses that they teach are very minimal. Um, and Ohio's grade card on this, we are one of the states that require it, but our grade card at the end of 2019 was an F on what we're actually teaching in the schools. So I've done a lot of work with junior achievement and I actually went out and taught finance in high school at my alma mater, Talawanda, uh, several, several years in a row. The lack of financial literacy traps people into the sucker cycle, often for life. Instead of putting their money to work, the sucker spends his money on foolish, uh, foolishly or deposits it into low interest uh, accounts. So when you think about it, you think, well, people don't make that much and they can't say, but that's not the truth. That's what George is saying. He said, people get a paycheck, they hand it off to somebody else who then they build wealth with, their, with the sucker's money. But then George says, but wait a minute, Americans don't make a whole lot, so it's no wonder that they feel trapped. But their spending says otherwise. If you look at the stats, and this is the average typical American, and if so if you're, this is one person. If you're a household of four, and you're doing eat out or take out, you're spending $181 per month per person. Uh, ride shares, we don't do a whole lot of here in Hamilton, but in some of your bigger places, area uh, urban areas they do they spend a lot on ride share we spend thirty dollars a month on events seventy four dollars a month on lottery tickets just think what that would be if they saved that money uh, coffee and latte 60 a month alcohol 29 a month I think that's low for Hamilton I don't know what you guys think I see Tiffany laughing I can't hear her but I see her laughing <laughs> I know people that spend that a day um, new clothing, $63 a month, and then our subscription services that we get sucked into, contracts and things like that, that we can't get out of, um, average $237 a month per person. No generation is saving enough money, not even close. The millennials only have about $23,000 saved for retirement. Gen X are 66. And us boomers who, let's face it, um, even the youngest boomers are getting really close to retirement. They only have 152,000 on average saved in personal accounts. So the sucker will think that the have and the have nots, it's the only way that, it's the way things have always been and it's the way things will always be. And the wealthy turn that around and they think that, well, even though people are not being taught all of this in school, I'm not gonna allow this economic crisis of financial illiteracy become my personal story. I'm gonna do something about it. So now we're gonna talk a little more about the power of compound interest. And Zoe out of the book uh, came up with the power of compound interest refers to the growth potential of money um, over time by leveraging the magic of compound interest, which means that interest is paid on the sum of deposits plus all interest previously paid. So um, you're making interest on top of interest and that's where the real fun begins. There's a story in the book for those of you that have read it about Rockefeller and how he realized as a young farm boy that um, he loaned a farmer $50 and the farmer paid him simple interest on the money over a certain period of time. But he realized how getting his money to work for him paid him more than if he worked for money hourly by himself. So when it switched and he understood compound interest, he really started making a lot of money. Um, you guys can't see this and neither can I because we're on the screen. Can I shift? Let's see. Oh, I only have one. one two, okay. So um, 
I see Nancy. I don't know why Nancy's the only one that's showing up now, but a simple interest example is that if I put um, $1,500 in a loan for someone and I only gain, if I gain 9% simple interest over a 50 year timeline, that $1,500 only grows to 8,250. But if we change that to compound interest, that same money growing at 9% annually, compounded monthly, grows to $132,777. So it's 16 times more money than the simple interest because you're earning interest on interest. So you can see the comparison there, 270. Um, this is if, an account is opened with $500 and each month $500 is added to the account. For 45 years, the money compounds at 9% interest and you can see um, what the difference is between simple and compound on that. So how do you want your money working? Of course, you want your money growing compounding. After 45 years, whose account is worth more, Sarah's or TJ's? You might remember this from the book. Sarah opened a savings account with 50,000, but TJ didn't have a lot of money, so he just started an account with $500 a month, both growing at 9% interest. And you can see the difference. Now, over the lifetime, TJ did put more money in than Sarah, but um, if consistent growth, he, he really accrued a lot of money as well. So consistency adds to the power of saving money. Um, this is uh, addressing the interest, mate, interest rate that you earn on your money. Absolutely, we all know that the interest rate matters. 1% um, is very low, and then you get up to 9%. I have a lot of people ask me, well, where can you get 9% growth on your money? The market has actually averaged about that over the last 100 years. So a sucker thinks I've worked hard for my money, so I just want to put it in someplace safe. I know people that bury it in their backyard, stick it under a mattress, but you get nothing for that. So the wealthy think I've worked hard for my money, so now it's going to work for me as hard as it as possibly can. So the time value money is another concept from the book that's critical and very important to understand. When it comes to money, that time is precious. You want to know and think about how many years do you have to pay off your car loan? How many years are you paying off your home mortgage? When are your kids gonna go to college? When do you plan on retiring? And one of the biggest kickers right now is your savings, when are you gonna run out of money in retirement? Because one of the biggest issues that we face right now in retirement is longevity. People are living so much longer that we're actually living longer in retirement than we actually worked. So don't freak out about all this. Um, knowing these numbers creates urgency and urgency drives action. And if you remember before, we talked about the only two things that you are in control of are your attitude, what you think about and how you think, and your activity, which is the actions that you take to do something about changing and making your life better. There are three time-tested actions you need to start now. Now is always the best time to start saving money. Don't contemplate like George is here thinking, well, I should have started a long time ago, so now it's too late. It's never too late. The time to start is now. You wanna save regularly and you wanna get the highest interest rate possible and you have to be patient because money grows over time. Um, starting earlier can make a significant difference. Sarah here started with um, setting aside $4,000 a year at the age of 22. She did that for eight years in a row, and then she stopped saving at age 29. George, however, didn't start until he was 30. He saved $4,000 a year for 38 years, so he invested a whole bunch more money into it than Sarah did. But if you look at the end at age 67, Sarah actually has more money than George. So time is critical. So the longer you wait to start saving, the more you need to come up with every month. That makes sense. This chart that I'm getting ready to switch to scares a lot of people. At the age of 20, um, you only need to save $113 a month to reach a million dollar goal by the age of 87. And this is assuming a 9% average annual interest rate compounded monthly. At the age of 40, you have to save $731 a month. But if you wait until you're 60, you have to save 
8,500 a month, um, which is pretty much impossible for most people to do. So how suckers think, they say, I know saving is important, but now is just not a good time for me to deal with this. And the wealthy think, here's the deal, time is money, every day counts, building my financial future starts now. So I love the rule of 72. For those of us in the industry, this is probably the magical equation that um, we, we love to share with people because it's, it's fun and it's, um, it's just a great way, it's kind of magical. If you remember um, Einstein in the How Many Works Challenge little video that I showed you, he talks about compounding interest and understanding this. This mathematical equation is can, he considered one of the um, best uh, things ever in life. So it's a mental math shortcut to know how long it's gonna take for your money to double. If you take 72 and divide it by the interest rate that you're getting, that will give you the number of years that it takes for your money to double. So 72 divided at 1% is 72 years. 72 at three is 24, six is 12, 9% is eight, and 12% is six. So people are like, well, who in the world is gonna have money growing at 1%? It's gonna take 72 years to double. But the sad part is, and this is a statistic, all the statistics that I'm giving you in this book have been verified and recently verified by MSNBC who did an article about the book because they were on their book tour and they validated every one of these um, statistics that I'm sharing with you in, a, in an article on their uh, website. There's almost $10 trillion in money market and passbook savings account averaging 0.09% today in the United States. That's amazing. Do you guys realize how much $10 trillion is? So 72 divided by 0.09% is 800 years. In other words, it's not going to double until 2820. So why do you think that is? Why would banks and institutions have your money doubling for you every 800 years? Do you think they have it invested at that rate or do you think they're making money on your money? Those same banks and credit card companies and investment firms are charging 17% average interest rate on credit cards. So 72 divided by 17 is 4.2 years to double. So that means they're paying you 0.09% and they're charging you 17%. So your money doubles in 800 years and their money doubles in 4.2 years. So a lot of these institutions don't really like the fact that we're out here educating people, but this is our mission. We believe that it, this, all of this money needs to go back into the hands of the people that are hardworking and earning it and not being saved out of ignorance at the banks and other financial institutions. Um, so Maya here wants to know if she has $500 in retirement today and she's 57 years old, what kind of interest rate does she need? So this mathematical equation works where you can divide it by the number of years that you have left and come up with the interest rate. So at 72, she has 10 years left and that she needs to get 7.2% interest to get where she wants to be. So once you know how money works, you will be compelled to ask questions like, is the bank account the best place to put my money? Am I willing to settle for a 1% or even a 2% rate of return? Is there a way I can get four or six or perhaps even higher? What type of higher interest rates still provide adequate safety? Can I finance or refinance my car loan or mortgage at a lower interest rate? Will the financial institution managing my money earn more interest than I will? And will I get enough doubles during my income earning years to reach my savings goals for retirement? If not, what do I need to change? So we talked about the seven money milestones. That's what the second half of the book um, goes into. I'm gonna stop the, the course basically at this point. We can go into further detail with this on another session or you can uh, learn more about it from the book. Um, the second part goes into understanding zero market risk 
what is the risk of long-term care to our financial well-being in retirement. Um, it actually is the number one risk that there is, along with longevity. Um, how do I get tax-deferred growth? What is a tax-free income and tax-free legacy? So there's critical information like the impact of taxes on how our money grows, and we need to understand those things, whether we pay taxes on the small money that goes in or the large money that comes out. So we talk about the seed and the harvest. There's different ways that money can be taxed. It can be taxed now, which is your typical um, earnings and dividends in a single year on interest uh, accounts. Then you have tax deferred accounts, which would be your IRAs and your um, 401ks uh, and vehicles like that. And then you have the never taxed accounts, which uh, an example of that would be a Roth IRA. You pay the tax as it goes in, the money grows tax deferred, but it does come out to you tax free. So the money discovery form at the back of the book um, is this, and it's the last couple pages of the book before the, the credits, um, is actually your GPS. It works just like a GPS in your car. In order for you to know how to get to where you want to go with your finances, you have to know where you are starting from. So that's what this discovery form does. It helps you have just a basic little worksheet of where things are, um, where what your goals are, what you intend, what you would like to have, and then it just asks you a few questions about where you are right now. So for more education, um, you can contact me personally at my phone number. You can go to this website. If you guys wanna screenshot this, feel free to. Um, just remember that education without execution is mere entertainment. So all of these concepts, all of this stuff that we're learning and that um, I'm teaching you, if you don't implement a plan, it's not gonna make any difference in your life. If you don't start um, trying to build your immune system, if you don't start thinking positively, if you don't understand the connection of spirit through meditation and prayer and just being in fellowship with other people, and you don't understand how money works or implement the lessons that you have learned, none of this information is gonna matter. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and go back to all of us on here. Open this up for any questions that anybody has. Joan Stidham commented on uh, the Facebook Live that she loved the book and she's working on all seven milestones. Yes, she is. Joan is a client of mine and I will say that she, I've known Joan for years. Joan was actually my um, tutor when I was going through college, I'm not um, really good in math. I'm horrible at math. So <laughs> I, hope, I hope my little presentation was impressive that I know um, how interest works and I know percentages. But Joan actually had to tutor me through my Algebra One, Algebra Two, and Trigonometry classes when I was in college. So I thank Joan for that comment. Anything else? I think a lot of it, like, is truly some simple math and simple premises, but um, starting early, I mean, if you look at some of those numbers, if you start when you're 20 and it's, you know, like $113 a month, or if you wait later, it just keeps increasing exponentially. So um, time is your friend. Absolutely. And that's why it's so important to get this education out especially um, in our schools. And I mean, our company's mission is, of course, it's never too late to start saving, but the earlier that you save, the better. So a part of the book that I didn't cover was um, the area of the million dollar baby and showing that if, as, as a grandparent, if you wanted to save $2,500 a month or a, um, a year for the first few years of your grandchild's life or deposit even $13,000, by the time that child is at retirement age, they're a millionaire. So they're talking about the pressure that would be taken off of that child, just growing up knowing that they're gonna have this type of retirement. Of course, a million dollars then is not gonna be what a million dollars is today. Um, we're finding even now, people try to shoot for a million dollars, but the big question is what's your number? How much money do you actually need? Yeah. How much money do you actually need to, to live the type of retirement that you want? And that's where that discovery form comes in. It's really hard to do this by yourself. That's why you need to find a financial professional 
that can help you work through this stuff and put you and introduce you to the products and the vehicles that you need to be able to reach these goals. But first you have to identify what your goals are. How do you want to live? Um, how many years until your mortgage is paid off? When you're 65 or 67 and now the new retirement age is 70, is your home going to be paid off? Or do you need that extra money to continue that house payment? Are you going to have a vehicle that you're paying for? I know people that retire and move to Florida that buy a condo, but guess what? You still have condo fees. You still have utility fees. You still have monthly expenses when you're retired that you, you have today. So some of those expenses never go away. But until you really sit down and prepare a formula and understand what it is and the way that you want to live, this should not be dictated to you. Your retirement is your decision. How do you want your retirement to be? What do you want it to look like? Do you want to travel? Do you want to do things later in life that you haven't been able to do now? Um, and then, then you got to look at the sacrifices. My favorite question to people all the time, when they tell me they want to do something, well, we want to buy a bigger house. We want to do this. We want to do that. I always ask at what cost? Because unless you understand how money works and what you are sacrificing by not putting that money away monthly in your early years, you have no idea what the true cost is of the actions that you're taking. So when people say, I don't have $100 a month to save, I'm like, well, let's look at your budget. What are you spending on a daily basis on those lattes or those coffees or those drive through fast restaurants? Um, and let's look at what that money could mean to you at a future date because that's what it truly is costing you. It's costing you what it will become, not what you're spending today. Yeah, I thought the part where you had the, uh, what the average American spends on items, that's a little shocking. Uh, <laughs> and if you multiply that by your entire household, um, that's a lot of money on a lot of things. And if each, each one of those sections, you could have just taken a small portion and be putting that to savings, you know, when, when you're making a budget. Oh, and that, that's the point. People don't understand at what cost it is when we make these decisions with, we are a I want it now society. And I blame the boomers. I mean, we have been horrible about that. We've, we've had a great run, you know, the market's been great. But like I said before, this crisis that we are facing now is a huge wake-up call on many levels. It's a wake-up call about how we are physically, how well we are taking care of ourselves. Are we responsible for what we eat and what we do? Absolutely, but people don't want to think that. We're responsible for our own health. We're responsible for our own health care. Um, we're responsible for our retirement. Um, if you're an entrepreneur, like me, I can't fathom the idea of working for somebody else. I have always been in complete control of my income, good or bad, it's on me. I can't blame anybody else. But that's the way that I choose to be. That's always what I've wanted to have happen. So um, the decisions that we make today and the instant gratification that we think we have to have can cost us a whole lot in the future if we don't understand all these concepts. always felt like I'm a pretty good saver and you know doing investing and all that kind of stuff but then sometime like this happens or you know whenever the market crashed the last time when it was you know you lost half of or more of whatever you had but now as I'm getting older it's harder to stomach too you know because I've always kind of like been in the growth mode you know and now it's like should I get out of growth mode and like try to just salvage but it's it's not for the faint of heart well, and that's why, Nancy, that's why working with a financial professional, and I'm not trying, I'm not pushing myself on you guys. You, you might have your own financial professional. Just find somebody to work with that, help, that helps you through and to maneuver the things in life that happen because things are going to happen. It's not if these emergencies or if these things are going to happen through life. They do. We have market corrections. We have things. When you're younger, you can handle stuff like that. But as we get older, we lose that time. We lose that time horizon with our investments. So 
What if you are 66, 67 years old today and this crash happens and you just lost half or a third of what you were planning on retiring with next year? So there's ways and there's products out there that if you're working with a licensed professional that they can teach you and guide you and help you with that GPS system. You know, what does a GPS do if there's a wreck up front? You know, down the road, you're going 75. Brandon and I were going to Atlanta to our home office one time and the GPS detoured us because there was a landslide, a mudslide on the highway that stopped the highway. So we kind of laughed about it because that's life, right? Things happen and things, we can have the best laid plans, but things shift and things change. So how, did, how do you know how to detour around that? And that's where the GPS comes in in the car, but that's where a financial professional comes in in your life in helping you through this. I have one, but it still makes me sick. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't have the heart for it, I think. <laughs> Well, and then that's your risk tolerance, and that's a whole nother conversation, and our risk tolerance changes as we age. Yes. So you need to make sure that your financial professional is fully licensed. Mm -hmm. As we have in our industry, I'm not knocking anybody, but we have people that are insurance representatives, and then we have people that are investment advisors and or investment representatives, and then we have people that are financial advisors and they're very different. So when it comes to what our philosophy with our company is, as far as understanding, we're educators, that's what we do, but we are fully licensed across the board with everything. I'm a licensed financial advisor. Mm -hmm. I hear you, Tiff, did you say something? I'm just telling my kids that I'm on a call and I can't answer them. <laughs> I thought you were talking to us. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. I saw your mouth moving. <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Tammy, I'd like I'd love to hear from you since you do the finance department. Oh, probably only a few things. Um, and mine is more life experience as well. Um, but credit rating. Um, it's unlikely that anyone that buys their first house will have the cash to buy that. But um, that's one thing that I tried to teach my girls besides everything that was in your books um, on how to establish a good credit rating and keep track of it. And one of the things I learned, and this is just an addition, um, I, they received as me as this co-signer, a $500 credit card when they were 16. And I made them buy gas only and they had to put the cash for the gas on my desk with the receipt. And then I paid the bill every month. And then I gave them the credit card when they were old enough and they took it to college. We still kept the, the max very low. Um, but it ends up when they went to buy their homes as they age, that credit card gave them their credit history that made them in the high 700s for a credit rating. And I really didn't even know I was teaching them that. I was really trying to teach them to not have debt, to pretend that I don't, I'm not one for debit cards. I don't like the fact the money's gone immediately. Um, so credit rating was the other part that I probably would add to, to teaching someone young. The other thing I encountered was when I had a daughter that did take a finance class and she was all excited at 17, wanting to start saving. But there really wasn't an, an economical way for her to invest very small amounts of money except for savings accounts. You know, like the minimum, this was, this was back in the 80s, mm -hmm. um, no, 90s. It was, diff, you know, like, you know, to open a brokerage account, you had to have more than they really had to start. So it did kind of delay them until, you know, they, they were having enough income that they could really put into it. But that's all. I, I've th I, I will tell you that I have achieved the seven milestones. <laughs> but the financial part, the other thing I would say is when we met with our financial advisor, because our, my husband and I worked at the same company and they closed it, I needed to know how to do a rollover at age 24. And I had no idea what a rollover was. Hence, I contacted a financial advisor. But when you meet with your advisor, 
I look at it is they keep you on track. You get homework every time you meet with them. They say, okay, you need to do this. And if, as long as I did what they told me to do every year, I, I went on the path. So I would tell everyone, deal with, you know, work with a financial advisor, unless you want to be well-versed in it. Life is too short to know everything. Um, right. And that's kind of the choices that people have after they read the book. We share with them, um, you can ignore it. You can, you know, decide this isn't for you and don't do anything, or you can decide to do it on your own, which is very difficult because on your own, you cannot purchase financial products. Right. You have to have a, a licensed financial representative to share with you what's the best for you. Now, um, there are accounts now that we can start people saving as little as $10 a month in a brokerage account um, for very, very small fees. Um, and let's face it, you can't get into a brokerage account without fees. It's not going to happen. Right. Um, the, credit, the credit rating is important. Um, it's very scary to me being on the college campus teaching and going to, in my 20 years I spent on a college campus, either going there or as a professor, seeing all the credit card booths that are set up everywhere trying to get these youngsters to get credit cards and they can they're over 18 they absolutely can but they're at huge interest rates these kids have no idea what to do with them and it's scary because it ruins their credit instead of helping their credit through that so where do they get that education to understand if they don't have tammy as their mom and how important the credit rating is um but there's just so many things now that are different than used to be um, the DOL just recently made all of us um, in the industry, if, if we're going to handle retirement accounts, we have to be a fiduciary. To be a fiduciary, you have to be a Series 65 licensed advisor. So there's a lot of people and a lot of companies that had to shift gears out there because they can't do this anymore. Our company was already positioned. I've been an advisor for 10 years. We, we had, we've always done and operated that bottom line, no matter what, you do what's right for the client 100% of the time. And that is doing your research and your investigation into what are their risk tolerances. You have to ask all the right questions. People have to understand where they are and we have to understand who they are. And um, then we have to do the research and make sure that we are offering them the appropriate products to get their plan in place. We also um, like to meet with our clients at least once a quarter. Um, it's mandatory, it is law by FINRA to meet once a year, and we have to do reports once a year with clients. But, but a financial guide, a financial advisor um, is your friend, they're not your enemy. If you find a good one, um, they're your partner for life to get you through this. And that's what we're trying to, to show people and teach people is there are people out there that will help you. There are people that will charge you to do it. And there are people like in our firm that we offer this guidance and this advice for free because the companies pay us, you don't. So that's how that all works. And a lot of people always think that they can't afford an advisor. They don't um, have enough money to have an advisor. And we laugh at that because it's like, it's not how much money you have now. Um, there are a lot of companies, a lot of firms out there that have minimums. If you don't have a half a million dollars, they won't talk to you. Our company just laughs at that. We don't care. Our goal is to get you to a half a million dollars. We don't care what you have today. We want to get you started and saving and get to where you want to be. It's a long-term deal. And I feel extremely fortunate because I'm in business with my son. So I feel like I can talk to young clients and I can start them in the process and guide them through because everything that I do will eventually turn over to Brandon and he can take it because it's much more than I am. So that's just, you gotta find somebody that you can build a relationship and that you trust and a company that you trust and get on the right path. Very interesting. Yeah, I think Judy's probably our youngest person here today. Um, what kind of things have you, did you read in the book that you saw that you would start doing or are there some things in the book that you're already doing? So I want to say first, thank you, Lisa, for giving me this book and the chamber. So 
when I started reading the book, I was thinking that um, I say to myself, I think I know a little bit about this because when I was in high school, I had the class. I say yes. Maybe I know what it's talking about, but after I really say, oh my God, I don't know nothing. <laughs> and when I start, when I got my first time, go to the bank to open a saving account, they are asking me a lot of questions. And I say, oh my God, I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> but because I had this person that actually give me a good advice, they help me a lot to say, you want this, we see you had this, you had this opportunities, this, this, this benefit. So yeah, the book, they help me to say, I need to start saving right now and not think later. So I'm saying thank you so much to open more my mind to this financial part. So yeah, I don't know how to say more. I kind of like, I have right now a lot of feelings <laughs> to start saving right now and say that, yes, no matter what you do, you need to start saying you want to have a better future. Very good. Thank you. You're welcome. So, anybody have any questions? Any other comments or thoughts? I have a, I have a thought. <laughs> um, I think that, uh, Lisa, your goal with Judith should be, because she's at a very young age, um, I think our goal should be to make her a millionaire. Absolutely. <laughs> I think she can do it. She's got time on her side, so. Yeah, she does. <laughs> very easy when you... When you start young and you're budgeting and you actually budget saving in your budget. You gotta pay yourself first. It's one of the main concepts. Exactly, you know, you've got that emergency fund set aside. So if there is an emergency, you know, you've got money for an emergency, but then you keep replenishing that, you know, it's a lifelong process. It doesn't happen overnight, so. Very fun. Um, and I think uh, a lot of things in the book were things that we've all read or seen before, but it's always good to see it again and have some reminders. So um, I think with that, everybody, yeah. any other comments? Um, I just want to say one thing, mm -hmm. uh, another thing. Kumar, thanks for joining us today. I sent you a message. Um, Kumar is the newest member um, of our team with, uh, with Easter Seals, so. Mm -hmm. Yes, he and Judy got to meet today, so that was interesting. Yeah. <laughs> See each other for the first time. Yeah. yeah. She's uh, talking to him anyway, probably, but yeah, the Zoom calls are actually very good for getting to see some people we haven't seen before. So we appreciate everybody taking some time today to learn from Lisa. And um, I think if that's all, we're going to wrap up for today and uh, we'll have another session to finish up the rest later. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dan, again. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Have a good one.